Ayan. So I am very pleased to introduce to you our resource speaker this morning. He is an assistant professor at the Department of History, College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, University of the Philippines, Diliman. He obtained his master's degree and bachelor's degree in history, minor in Hispanic studies, cum laude, at the Ateneo de Manila University. He is currently pursuing his PhD in history in UP Diliman. He has published his scholarly works on local and national history in various academic journals, such as the Philippine Studies, Historical and Ethnographic Viewpoints in Ateneo de Manila University, Philippine Social Sciences Review in University of the Philippines de Leman, the Journal of History, and the Hispan the Filipiniana Sacra, among others. His research interests include church history, demographic history, quantitative approaches to history, and individual ambition during the colonial era. I know we are all excited to meet our resource speaker this morning. So without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome in the virtual stage, Professor Nicholas Michael C. Hi, good morning. This paper is in argument format. Uh, so what that means is that the first part is going to be a little bit technical. Uh, I'm going to identify something that other people have not yet discussed, other historians have not yet discussed. Then I will set a research question that tackles that need. And I'll, uh, I'll talk in a very limited way uh, about how I plan to answer that question. Uh, so again, bear with me, it's going to be a little bit technical. I also want to point out that the focus of my paper is on the Maestres de Campo. Um, it, it's a, as a local response to Spanish colonization. So when I talk about Andres Malong and Andres Lopez, it's as examples of Maestres de Campo. So uh, I would like to begin with this uh, quotation on screen. And uh, I'd like you to look at three things here. First is the position of Maestro de Campo. Second is the scepter or the vara de mando or the baston de mando, uh, which was his colonial symbol of office. So that's number two. And number three, the dominion that he was trying to assert here, which is much larger, much larger than a municipality. So we're going to go back to those three points uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, the, the argument that I'm trying to make is actually simple. Uh, so have a look at the timeline. When historians talk about political leadership among indi indigenous Filipinos, they talk about rajas and datus and sultans on one end um, and gobernador silios on the other. In the time and space outside the colonial order, you had rajas and sultans. But within the colonial order, as far as historians are concerned, the highest position that locals could reach was the gobernador sitio. And, you know, some of this does make sense. So uh, in 1755, one petitioner, and his name is, uh, his signature is there on the screen, uh, he petitioned to become uh, an alcalde mayor. He, he petitioned to become provincial governor. And he was denied with six brief words, some margin and document. Estas no se dan a indios. This is not given to indios. So, in other words, buhang bawal ngang mag, mag a provincial position. But what I'm saying in this paper is that there is one position, the maestre de campo, or field marshal, that does have a provincial level command. And there are a couple of historians that have come close to talking about this. There, are the ch there is a chapter by Edgerton in the book in yellow over there on the left. And then there is a chapter by Paredes in her own book there in the middle. But both of them stop short, either because it's not their focus or because they lack the archival manuscripts to, to look into the matter. Most important was the work of Rosario Cortez, um, over there, the classic, uh, who says that the field marshal had great social prestige and was the provincial governor's right-hand man in dealing with the locals. But Cortez does not tell us how the position was attained. 
what its roles were, and how come we don't hear about it today. So I tackle those three questions on the left in order to help me answer my main question there at the bottom. And my main question is, were early colonial indigenous elites actually confined to the municipal level of political leadership? In other words, hagang gobernador silio lang ba talaga sila? So, in answering those questions, I tackle the matter broadly. But my argument is strongest for the seven years from 1654 to 1660 in Pangasinan. Uh, so there's my scope there on the, the lower right-hand corner. At the same time, you know, there were, there were many types of maestres de campo, and I'm starting to think that each ethnicity within the colony actually had its own. But my focus is on the indigenous maestres de campo, the maestres de campo de naturales. Lastly, in terms of scope, I'd like to say that this is not a military history. I focus on the, the non-military aspect of the, uh, of the maestres de campo and on indigenous agency as a whole. I am not a military historian. Okay, so in the slides that follow, I do four things. I discuss the position's role and how it was attained. That's number one and two. Then I talk about the case of Pangasinan and Andres Malong. That's number three. And finally, I tackle how the position disappeared and what that can tell us about the changing way that Indios were participating in colonial government. So first, part one, the position's role. Um, the first documented use of the title is in the 1530s for the leaders of the army of Charles V in Italy. It was an important rank just under the commander in chief. In the Philippines, it was a title as, uh, it was a title given to Indios that shows up in the year 1605 uh, to 1608. So that was the beginning of it. In, in those years, the archipelago's procurator in Spain tells the king that the Spaniards in the Philippines had been teaching the Indios Spanish ways of war and had been giving military titles to them, including the title of Maestre de Campo. Now, the procurator thought that this was unnecessary and dangerous. And in, in retrospect, when we see uh, Malong and um, Lopez, he might actually have been correct. Um, there were maestres de campo within the colonial military and outside of it. Within the military, uh, the maestre de campo was usually a pampango, a pampangan, a member of an ethnic group that was one of the colony's closest allies during its early years. But outside the military, in the militia, there were maestres de campo per province, with some province having further subdivisions per district or per ethnicity. Now, the indigenous would have been familiar with the concept of receiving uh, military titles from faraway empires. Between the year 1003 and the year 1011, the Datu of Butuan sent four tribute missions to China and by the fourth mission received military titles from the emperor. Similar missions were sent from Pangasinan, Mindoro, and Sulu. And in 1417, the emperor granted the Sulu Sultan the title Prince of his realm. Um, so when the Spanish crown offered military titles also, it would not have been a surprise to the locals. The surprise would have been the, the level of political intervention that came with affiliating with the Spaniards in this way. Um, it was not something the Chinese had tried to do at the time. Nevertheless, the Spanish Empire was at the time in an expansion mode and the recruitment of local leaders to help them expand into Southeast Asia and into East Asia, that would have been well in keeping with what the pre-colonial Datu saw as their own natural roles and responsibilities. The Datu led the people into battle and viewed war as an opportunity to gain prestige, wealth, and labor. And the Spanish Empire, they offered just that. They offered military titles, pensions, and encomiendas prestige, wealth, and labor. So there was a military side to this, but the role also had a political dimension. 
especially in Pangasinan. So I have two examples. I know there are three bullet points, but uh, you'll see how this makes sense in a moment. So in 1745, with bullet point number one, there was a dispute about community funds in Pangasinan, and the dispute was between the municipal governments and the provincial government. Official communications to the Assembly of Municipal Mayors was always sent through the Maestre de Campo. How come? Well, one scribe involved, who was involved there explained that, uh, and I quote, uh, with the first bullet point, it was the practice and style among the natives that the proceedings in which everyone is commonly interested in are to be made known to the aforesaid Maestre de Campo. And here's a letter from around that time written in, um, in Pangasinan. Uh, I say around that time because it doesn't have a date in itself, but it's inserted in documents from um, the 1740s and 50s. Mm. The, the Master de Campos name is at the very top. Um, and I, I had a friend translate it, and it, it reads The Master de Campo General Don Bernardo de Vera, with all the Captain Basal and other Anakbanwa, Cabeza de Barangay of Binmale, a town of the said province, and so on and so on. Now, these are very indirect hints that the Maestro de Campo is serving as a sort of representative for other local leaders. Uh, we can go back to this later in open forum if you'd want, if you want to help me um, translate it further. Um, so the above was a very indirect hint, uh, but now we're gonna go to uh, something more direct in bullet points number two and three. And this involves our secondary character, Andres Lopez, Don Andres Lopez, uh, right-hand man during the, uh, the Polaris Revolt. It was in 1762, uh, the British had captured Manila, the Spanish colonial government was on the run, the colony was in chaos, and the people of Binalatongan, with excellent timing, uh, submit a list of demands to the colonial government. And among these demands was that the position of Maestre de Campo had to be given to leaders uh, from uh, Binalatongan from San Carlos. Uh, at the, in the past, kasi it had been given to, to different municipalities and they wanted it for their residents. And later on, they demanded that it be given at present to Don Andres Lopez. Now, I don't know a lot about Lopez just yet. I'm still studying his life. But according to the Dominican Juan Ferrando, the governor, uh, the governor general confirmed Lopez's appointment as Maestre de Campo and gave him the authority to hold elections for low-level civil and judicial offices with the assistance of a missionary. Now, what's important here is not just that it was such a prominent position at Pinagawayan siya, uh, and not just that the Maestre de Campo could manage elections. So these are both important, huh? What is most important is that the chronicler who was writing this, um, this information almost 100 years later in the 19th century, at the time when the, uh, the Maestres de Campo no longer existed, this author had to explain to his reader what the position of Maestre de Campo was. He had to define it, and he defined it as jefe superior de todos los municipios, the head of all the municipalities. So the data surrounding the case of Andres Lopez shows us clearly that there is this political dimension to this otherwise military role. Now, I'd like to point out uh, that this combination of military and political roles was not strange to anyone. The Spaniards in Manila had a city government, and that city government was primarily run by military men. And the Datus themselves, during the pre-colonial era, they had had both political and military authority. In short, the Maestro de Campo embodied both Spanish and indigenous expectations. And in Pangasinan, it was, the, it was at the provincial and not just the municipal level. 
All right, so part two, how is the position attained? Um, officially, appointments were made by the governor general. The, the 1696 ordinances for good government, for instance, state that the provincial governors should not give the title uh, of maestres de campo. Instead, when a position becomes vacant, they were to send three names to the governor general, and the governor general would pick one. But in practice, uh, local government officials did sometimes pick the maestre de campo. Um, one example is in Ilocos in 1700, the year 1700. And another example is from Mindoro in the, the, the 1750s when an encomendero on his own appointed a, a, a maestre de campo. So uh, we've tackled to, uh, we've tackled who gave the position in theory and in practice, but to whom was it given? Who, to whom was it given? So my basis here is a record of colonial grants called the Media Anata. Now, these grants were compiled every year. And on the slide, you see that there were a lot of details included in each entry of that register. There, there are many caveats to the use of this register, and I won't mention them here. What I did was I, uh, I took seven years of this register, the seven years prior to Malong's revolts, and I looked for military men and the maestres de campo. In that period, there were roughly 4,684 entries, so not roughly exactly that amount. And my research assistants, you know, they helped me transcribe all of these. Uh, roughly 3,000 entries were identifiably given to Indios. And so you see them in orange here, this one here, 3,000 entries. And roughly 400 of those um, orange entries were military positions given to Indios. 33 of the positions were given to the Maestres de Campo. And these are the 33. Uh, have a look for a moment. Just gonna get myself water. So what I want to show here is that when we talk about Andres Malong in a moment, he is one of them. Uh, when we talk about uh, Andres Lopez, he is a, a much later version, but he's also one of them. One maestro de campo was Don Pedro Amo, and this is that one here, district around Manila. He uh, was described in the document itself as a descendant of La Candula. He became a maestro de campo in 1655. His command encompassed several pueblos around Manila. In 1660, he was in turn replaced by Sargento Mayor from Ermita. Another example is Don Miguel Tumaru from Samar, and his entry is here. In 1655, he received the command of Leyte, Samar, and Ibabao. On that same day, he paid for a grant that exempted two of his slaves and their wives from tribute and from government requisitions of labor. They received that exemption for the entire time that Tumaru was maestro de campo. So it's like a perk of the office. A third example is Don Alonso Soliven of Vigan, who received an encomienda and the permission to include in that encomienda as many people as he could capture from the mountains. So his was an encomienda grant. Um, he had become a maestro de campo a little bit, a little bit earlier. So, you know, we barely know of the Maestros de Campo in history, uh, but there were actually a lot of them. And two of them were Andres Malong and Andres Lopez from Pangasinan. There's a more technical finding that I do here, which, uh, which is where I look at the correlations and the odds ratio. Essentially, my finding is that if you're a principalia, you have about 40 times the chance of a non-principalia to be paying for a military position. And if you're a principalia, you had about five times the chance of a non-principalia to be paying for the position of the maestre de campo. In, in other words, 
it was the Principalia who were becoming the Maestres de Campo. But it wasn't always that the powerful people who were becoming Maestres de Campo. In the early colonial era, they did. And among the Zambals in 1703, for instance, here in the left, uh, it was, I quote, individuals with great followings among their people who were given the military title. But things changed. And I'll, I'll give you an example, and it's related to these entries here on the right. Um, we have the case of Soliman, not Praha Soliman, yeah, to be absolutely clear. Uh, this is Soliman from Ilocos. He was an upland chieftain, and one day he came down uh, and talked to someone from the Spanish military, and what he had with him was this tattered, tattered piece of paper. The piece of paper was a grant given to his ancestor over 100 years ago uh, that had given his ancestor the title of Maestre de Campo. His father had inherited the piece of paper, but now his father was very old and people, the community didn't, the different communities, because he was head of more than one, they didn't respect him. And Soliman wanted the government to give him, Soliman, the title of Maestre de Campo and enough soldiers to win back control over his communities. And, you know, he, he got what he wanted. In short, when we ask about who became Maestre de Campo, in the beginning, here on the left, it was strong people who the government wanted on their side. But later, on the right, it may have been weak people, and these weak people were the ones who wanted the government on their side. The roles became reversed. Once the past Hispanica had cut away alternative sources of authority by adding in the tribal from a stepping And uh, this is where we try to situate Andres Malong somewhere in this continuum. So, Rosario Cortez states that uh, pre the pre colonial social organization in Pangasinan was, and I quote from her, informal, folk sustained, uncentralized, and still without specific agencies. There was still no power external to the family that limited or interfered with its authority. Um, okay. Is, it the, is the audio a little bit choppy? Hmm. Okay. So uh, I leave the, the technical for um, our organizers to, uh, to work through. Um, if there are... Uh, things that I, I need to repeat later, um, don't worry, I'd, I'd be happy to do so. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> uh, Rosario Cortez, um, it, I quote her, she says, the above, informal, folk sustained, uncentralized, still without specific agencies. Uh, there was still no power external to the family that limited or interfered with its authority. So, end quote. Um, the first colonial expedition to Pangasinan was made in 1571, uh, but the province was only founded in 1580. And Andres Malong was uh, born approximately 40 years later, around the year 1620. He was born in what is today San Carlos, as an Anakbanwa, or a member of the native aristocracy. In his youth, he entered uh, the Dominican school of San Juan de Letran in Manila. After returning to Pangasinan, he settled in Mangaldan, where he held various municipal offices, including that of municipal mayor. He also, uh, he rose up the ranks of uh, the provincial military as infantry captain, he led men against the upland communities in the province's mountains. 
in one case, he captured one person and beheaded seven and brought their heads back to his superior. He also hunted down lowlanders who had been hiding in the mountains. He, in, in one case, he killed two and captured five. So he's very much working with the, the colonial government. Later, the governor made him Sargento Mayor. So he was climbing the ranks of the local militia. Sometime between um, 1644 and 1653, Malong became the province's Maestre de Campo. And he did a lot of services for the government as Maestre de Campo. He collected tribute from several towns. Uh, he fortified San Juan Bautista in what is now Nueva Vizcaya. And he brought food to Manila. In 1656, he was given a, a small encomienda. Now, in October of 1660, something happened. Don Francisco Maniago, a Pampango field marshal or Maestro de Campo, revolted against the Spaniards. And Malong followed suit in December of that year and made himself king. Now, one chronicler says that he grasped his vara de mando like a royal scepter. It was his symbol of power as a maestre de campo, and now it would be his symbol of power as king. So I have there pictures of what that might have looked like. Uh, these are varas de mando of um, gobernador Silios. With his scepter in hand, Malong had some 11,000 troops, and soon he was attempting to coordinate with Maniago in Pampanga while sending forces into Ilocos. He activated kinship relations for this purpose, drawing in relatives and friends. In managing his new kingdom, Malong made at least three other appointments. Don Pedro Gumapos as conde or count, Don Francisco de Pacaduca as oidor or judge, and Don Melchor de Vera as his own maestre de campo. He was nagapoint na siya ng sarili niyang maestre de campo. Like Malong, de Vera had also studied in Letran. And according to Father Bazaco, whose book is there on the left, uh, written in 1933, published before the archives of Letran were burned uh, by the war, According to Father Bazaco, De Vera joined Malong together with, I quote, other former students of Letran, Pedro de la Peña, Ignacio de Oñate, Nicolas de Vargas, José Celis, Pedro Almazan, Juan Ferns, Gaspar Cristobal, and various others. And on the opposing side, on the side of the colonial government, there were other former students of Letran, including Bernardo Lugan, born in Pampanga, Hernando Lopez, born in Manila, and Juan de Lara, born in Taiwan, during the Spanish-Filipino occupation of that island. By February of the next year, the revolt was over and Malong was captured. He was executed in Dingayan. Most of his subordinates, uh, most of the subordinate leaders, rather, were hanged in San Carlos. And now, one person who was instrumental in his downfall was another indigenous leader, Don Pedro Lomboy, and we have a media anata made out to him here. As a reward for his services, Pedro Lomboy was made Maestre de Campo. He and his entire family were then exempted from tribute uh, and government requisitions for the rest of their lives. So you'll see here the word Maestre de Campo. You see the, the exemption made out to him for his loyalty and fidelity and so on. Now, Malung's leadership was built on the one hand on his indigenously recognized status as Sanak Banwa, which made him an important asset to the crown. However, his appropriation of decidedly colonial symbols and colonial titles of authority and his mobilization of a decidedly colonial network of followers gives one a pause for thought. At the Spanish Empire's eastern frontier, colonial structures combined with indigenous ambitions had, within just a century, facilitated one India's consolidation of a broad regional power that had not existed in this area prior to the conquest. So, in the next section, 
I described the position's eventual disappearance and close my presentation. So why are we unfamiliar with the post of Maestro de Campo today? By the 18th century, the Spanish Empire's interest in military expansion into Southeast Asia and East Asia had waned. During the height of their expansion, they, uh, during the first century of the rule, they had mobilized over 40,000 Indian soldiers and sent them to Borneo, to Indonesia, Cambodia, Singapore, Taiwan. But with the end of Spanish dreams of external expansion, the Philippine outposts no longer needed to mobilize such large India fighting forces at the drop of a hat. Neither did it need to, uh, to have its militarized principalia, who, it turned out, in the case of Malong, were as much of a threat as a resource. The significance of the position of Maestre de Campo likely changed during this period. In the early environment, here, in the early environment where few of the elements of colonialism had been introduced, the position enticed leaders who were already prominent based on indigenous basis of authority to join the Spanish cause. But colonial institutions over time undermined and replaced these bases of authority. Eventually, the position itself was reduced to a path to power for people who were reliant in the first place on the colonial order for their power. We talked about Soleiman earlier, um, if you remember him. By the time he requested for the position of Maestre de Campo in 1811, it was outdated. So in fact, you know, someone tried to explain to him that the title was no longer in use and tried to convince him to please accept something else. But he wanted the title of Maestre de Campo, and, and so he got it. But his case was likely uh, an exception. And I suspect that uh, with this position's disappearance and with the transition of the colonial military away from a system of vassals recruiting their own followings here on the left into a bureaucracy uh, that used enforced recruitment, aka the Quintas, here on the right, with this transition, the gobernador Silio then be truly became the highest political position that an Indio could attain. And the Maestres de Campo, who, had, um, who once had much broader followings and much broader influence, virtually disappear from memory. So finally, I return to my research question. Were early colonial indigenous elites confined to municipal levels of political leadership? The short answer is no. We think of the governor Silio, but he was not always the height of indigenous of the indigenous career ladder within the colonial order. I've shown that during the early colonial period, especially for Pangasinan, the indigenous maestre de campo had a broader authority built on both indigenous and colonial basis of power. There are Many other questions that I've not been able to answer. I can tell you later how I've struggled to answer these questions. Um, hopefully in the future we can return to the, these questions. And I hope that this paper's uh, modest contribution has at least made these questions a little more interesting. Um, I wanted to end with this slide. It's the quotation that we started with. Uh, so hopefully when we look at the life of Andres Malo, and Andres Lopez as well. We see him now as a maestre de campo, at the height of the colonial career ladder, combining both indigenous and colonial bases of power to create something new. Um, there, are, there, are, there are many people I have to thank for this research, and I will thank you all in the acknowledgments uh, when this is published. For now, I'd like to thank this lecture's listeners uh, for your patience. I really welcome your guidance and I, I look forward to your comments on how to improve this study. So, back to you, organizers. Oh, all right, I think Prof. Nicholas is ready. <laughs> okay, so let me read, sir, yung ating first question. Curious question daw po. Do you think Malong was able to develop his ambition to become a king 
because of the political environment that he had in Manila during his stay in Letran or in Pangasinan, how would you characterize his vision of a ruled, quote-unquote, prop, ruled territory? Does it have indigenous connotation, regional Pangasinan kingdom, or something that is synonymous with how Spanish viewed their empire? So this question is coming from an anonymous attendee prop. And it's a it's a very intelligent anonymous attendee. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of both. Uh, I, uh, see, I'm still looking for uh, the indigenous conception of kingship, uh, so I have to look into that. Uh, but definitely within their curriculum in Letran, they would have been exposed to the concept of king as it was understood um, uh, overseas. So I think it just uh, just as much as his uh, being Maestro de Campo was a combination of two things. I think also his combination of uh, his conception of kingship kingship would have been the same. And I think that you are right that it would be through Letran that he would get the Spanish side of things. All right, thank you very much, Prof. So okay, po ba dun sa ating anonymous attendee? Um, if you if you want to type in follow up question, that's all right. Um, here's another question, Prof. Uh, Prof coming from Duke. Ayan. Do we have documentation on how the position of Maestro de Campo was used in Palawan? Um, indirectly, we there is this book uh, written by Robert B. Fox in the 1980s. Uh, where he talks about the Tagbanwa in Parawan. You see, this is the 1980s, but the Tagbanwa still have a position called the Masikampu. The Masikampu is the Maestre de Campo. Um, but the, when Fox studied it in the 80s, uh, he said that the people there uh, trace the, the origin of the title back to titles given by the Sultan of Brunei and the Sultan of Sulu, which is, it might be possible because um, these Sultanates were in close interaction with the Portuguese and the Spanish. They may have adopted the title. They may have granted the title. It's, it's, it's possible. But, um, but, most uh, but because of the evidence of um, uh, a grant, a Spanish grant of Maestro de Campo from the 1600s, maybe, I think it's via the Spanish. Now, uh, I bring this up because Fox describes how uh, the Masikampu, uh, what his interaction was at the local level in Palawan among the Tagbanwa. Um, and he is a very much a political, judicial, religious role. He, uh, there is the belief there that if you argue with the Masikampu, you'll get a, an upset stomach because it, of the intense spiritual power of the Masikampu. So, so, you know, this is the title alive in the, the 20th century in, in one form. So. Thank you very much, Prof. Here's another curious question, daw po, Prof. <laughs> Who was the person behind the creation of the position Maestro de Campo? And who was the first Filipino elected to that position? Okay, uh, the first position, like in Spain, I don't know. Uh, oh, sorry, I guess in Italy, since our first documented use is in Italy. I don't know who decided it, although I know it was under Charles V, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, and also King of Spain, um, uh, where we're, we're named after his son, for instance, right? Um, but among the Filipinos, our first recorded Maestres de Campo are two individuals who had helped the Spaniards fight off the Chinese in Manila in the early 1600s. Uh, this is the 1605-1608 document that I was talking about. It's Don Guillermo de Maracot from Pampanga and Don Ventura, Men Don Ventura de Mendoza from Mahay Hay in Laguna. So this is like just a couple of few decades after uh, uh, consolidation of rule and mm -hmm. we, we begin to have them. All right. Thank you very much, Prof, for answering that question. Um, here's, here's a question coming from Kevin. What are the natives' responses, if any, when they find out that Malong exhibited colonial patronage being a maestro de campo? Uh, 
uh, I think the uh, it, it's a good question. I think that the best way to go about answering it would be to try to look for petitions from the time. Um, because we can make guesses, you know, like, uh, I know this from, uh, not Malong, but from uh, the Polaris Revolt. Um, uh, in the Polaris Revolt, uh, Father, there's a, there's a Dominican there, his name is Father Melendrez. He is caught up in this entire revolt. He is basically trapped and um, the, the, the locals in Pangasinan are making demands from him. Uh, and he says that uh, when finally the, the governor general agreed to the demands, uh, when Simon and, and De Anda agreed to the demands, um, he had the locals in Pangasinan um, sign a document saying that they regret kicking out their alcalde mayor, they are uh, professing their loyalty to, uh, to the Spanish king and so on. And Melendrez says the locals signed it, but the locals didn't really believe it because he says that the people in Pangasinan told him that uh, uh, just because our skin is brown does not mean we cannot govern ourselves. Look at the ants. The ants govern other ants of the same color. So I think that that is the, uh, this claim of uh, this belief that, hey, you know, we can govern ourselves. That might have been also what uh, uh, was experienced some, it's a hundred years earlier. So best always to look for data from that period. But, but I think that that's what it is. Okay, so I hope that answers your question, um, Sir Kevin. Here's another question, Prof, coming from an anonymous attendee. As someone who's from outside the province of Pangasinan and studying history, do you find Pangasinan as a unique cultural heritage based on your research? Um, I, I defer to the Center for Pangasinan Studies for this one point. In terms of Maestres de Campo, uh, it is a shared thing. For the other aspects of Pangasinan heritage, I defer to you. Okay, po. Um, okay, Prof. Here's another question. Did the Maestro de Campo rank is also accessible for a mixed race like Sanglays, given that Pangasinan is one of the center of trade in northern Luzon? Yes. Surprisingly enough, the, the Mestizos de Sangle had their own Maestro de Campo. So I'm like, okay, so they have their own troop of Mestizos soldiers? That's uh, it still has to be looked into, but it's it's really surprising. Yeah. Okay, Paul. Um, all right, Rob. Here's a question from Vincent. Do you recommend any books or sites where we can read further about this particular point in Philippine history? Um, for Pangasinan in particular, uh, the, the work of Rosario Cortez remains a classic, and that would be the, the very first step. Uh, for this era as a whole, the, the 1600s, uh, there are not a lot of materials. Um, we at the Department of uh, with the UP System is, is sponsoring a project called Project 2021, um, headed by uh, Maria Serena Diokna. So, uh, Dr. Diokna, the, the first volumes of this multi-volume series are going to talk about the 1600s. Uh, and, and the 1700s. So those will be coming coming up hopefully within the year and those would be the main resource. Thanks, Prof. Um, here's a question from John Lon de Vera. Ayan, sabi po niya, if I remember correctly, it was mentioned by Rosario Cortes in her book, Pangasinan, 1801 to 1900, that the 19th century Pangasinan was generally peaceful even during the 1896 Philippine Revolution. You also mentioned that the possession of Maestre de, Camp, de Campo disappeared in early 1800s. Do you believe that this position is very significant in the two Pangasinan revolts of 17th and 18th century? And if so, is there a possibility of another revolt in 19th century Pangasinan if there was still a Maestre de Campo? Um. 
It's an interesting question that one and one that tackles multiple centuries. And I think it ties in with another question that I saw uh, a little bit earlier, uh, which had to do with is there still Maestro de Campo in the 20th century? And uh, I talked a little bit about it for the Tagbanwang, but in Pangasinan, there's something I'm looking into. This is this, this might be completely wrong. Okay, this is just this might be completely wrong. But uh, Pedro Penular, um, uh, he he is a sacralista, uh, and he this is a, this is the 1930s, and he participated in the revolution. Um, he uh, participated in the the sacralista revolt as well, and. The Sactilistas at that time, they had an internal uh, militarized ranks that they gave themselves. And he gave himself the rank of field marshal, which is Maestro de Campo. So you, you begin to wonder, is this the same? Did, did he have them old Maestro de Campo in mind? Is it something completely new? Uh, to answer the question, that would be where I would begin looking. All right, thank you, Prof. Um, here's a question from Pia Marco. Sabi po niya, were you able to find the document that stated that there will be no longer, uh, there will no longer be native maestra de campo to be appointed? Um, I'm still looking. Uh, the closest thing that I have to it is from a secondary source. But he doesn't cite his own source for it, so it's I have to verify it. But I think it happens around the time of the Bourbon reforms. Now, um, because uh, when they change uh, the the system, the the model for the military, they, they enter a French model for the military, and instead of Maestro de Campo, you had I think uh, Colonel. I'm not so sure. So uh, Pia would actually know this better than me because she specializes in in um, um, in the, the Guardia Civil and the, the military of this era as well. So I, I don't know. Not yet. Thank you, Po. Um, question coming from Krija Banes. Could it be possible if we include Pangasinan under Ilocos region from the district and provincial level appointments of Maestro de Ocampo, 1654 to 1660, considering that Malong and Lopez are from Pangasinan? I just noticed that some provinces are identified. Might be considered, sabi po niya. Um, on your main question, this is, uh, I once again defer to the Center for Pangasinan Studies, but uh, these were not overlapping, at least in terms of the Maestro de Campo for the 1600s, which is what I study. These were not overlapping jurisdictions. These were separate jurisdictions. Thank you, Prof. Question coming from Mr. Fernandez. Sabi po niya, this is just speculative, sir, but is it possible that one of the reasons this rank was withdrawn in the latter parts of early 1800s is that the Spaniards saw how this rank may spark further retaliations or uprisings during that era? Uh, yeah, I think that that had always been the risk. Like, since the very beginning, when the procurator, whose name, by the way, is Fernando de los Rios Coronel, in the 1605-1608, when he, when he saw it happening from the very beginning, he was saying, this is a threat. Um, but in the early years, in the 1600s, it had always been useful. So yung, uh, yung balance of benefits at risk had always weighed in the side of uh, benefits. Because the Spaniards needed uh, leaders who could organize communities very quickly to create a large fighting force so they can go to Cambodia, for instance. Uh, by the 1700s, that was no longer the case. So without those benefits, the risk was still there. And so I think that was, uh, that was in the background. Although really the, the most, the, the, the biggest change would be that uh, change in military models from the old system to the French models with the Bourbon reforms. Because there, officially, like in words, they will stop using uh, the title. 
Thank you, Prof. Here's a follow-up question in relation to the mestizos de sangle that was raised earlier. Did they use it as an instrument to rise from the bottom of the social hierarchy during the early Spanish colonial period? Um, the best way to answer this would be via sources from the period. So I have not specialized in it. You are welcome to 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 look at look up look it up and uh, and we can talk about it even after the, the this event. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, my guess, my hypothesis is probably yes. Just like everyone else, they would have used this as one route. Uh, to to state status. Thanks, Prof. Um, here's a curious question. Sabi po niya, how do you preser preserve those information? Do you write books or just pass orally? Also, how is it important to the youth to be knowledgeable on this kind of matter? Um, well, for... For me, I, I I do both. You know, I, I participate in um, events like this, and so thank you for the to the Center of Fungus and Studies. Um, and I, I also write, um, and uh, I think the writing might um, uh, be good also. And uh, I think it's it's a good idea for everyone to do a little bit of both. Um, in terms of oh, and and because also the events help the writing help. Um, develop the writing, uh, show you what people are interested in, and show you areas to improve. Mm. In terms of relevance to people today, um, it's a little bit of a, a breaking down this idea that we are progressing from uh, a nothing in the pre-colonial era into a something today. That idea uh, makes the assumption that we were nothing in the, the 1600s, which is not true. I mean, even in the 1600s, we have people here with uh, very relevant concerns, very personal concerns, as well as very social concerns who are taking action to better their society, even in the 1600s. So I think being able to communicate that with, uh, with listeners, with students, is, is important. Thanks, Prof. Um, here's a question from Jomil Liza. Does the role of the Maestra de Ocampo resembles a position in the Philippine military today? Uh, hey, uh, field Marshal. Sorry, I know there's a, I think it would be a little bit of a, uh, it would be, it's not an exact match, you see? So I would, uh, I would have to see what the roles and responsibilities are of the military men today versus back then, which is a little difficult, but it's more or less field marshal. Thanks, Prof. Um, here's a question from an anonymous attendee. How about Summer and Leite? Do you have a list of names if who became Maestro de Ocampo? Maestro yeah, de um, so... <clears throat> Under this project, I've been processing the media anata, which are those grants, right? And I have the grants from the 1650s all the way to the uh, year 1700. And there are even more uh, that we're still trying to get from the archives in Spain that go into the 1700s. So my research assistants and I, um, my, my undergraduate um, research assistants, we have been transcribing them for over a year now. And yes, we, we <laughs> it's all in Excel. Just put there later and all the names for later will show up. Uh, yeah, we have them. Um, here's another question from an anonymous attendee prof. In 500 years of Christianity, as well as the colonization of the Spaniards, what are your reference or references in those information? Is it a primary source, a first-hand evidence? Sorry, could you repeat the first part of the sentence? Um, in 500 years of Christianity, as well as the colonization of the Spaniards. What are your reference or references for those information? Um, it's a mixture of both. Um, you have the secondary sources so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to like prove everything from the from scratch. 
but uh, we also try to say things that are are new and that uh, improve our understanding of that period. And for those, we go to the primary sources. So for this particular project, um, due to uh, the, the project I'm under with, uh, with Mam Jokno, we were sent to Spain for a while and I uh, was there for three months, visited archives in Seville, Valle de Lille, Avila, and it was medio <laughs> a bit of a struggle to try to look for data. I, I, I just to sh tell you, I, I was trying, to, I'm very interested in recruitment. How did the Maestro de Campo recruit people? And I spent three weeks in the archive in Seville looking for this question, not finding it. So, so yeah, it's it's a lot of digging um, uh, with for primary sources and also using with uh, secondary sources. All right, thank you, Prof. I hope that answers your question, um, anonymous attendee. Here's a question coming from Jeril Brudo, Prof. Why did Andres Malong revolt against the Spaniards? Uh, so we were we were talking about uh, uh, the use of uh, secondary sources. I defer here to the work of Rosario Cortez, who discusses it in detail. So uh, that that particular, I think it's chapter four. Okay. Um. Here's a curious question, Prof. Since our topic is about colonization, is there any good thing po na naidulot nito? Uh, just a correction to earlier, it's chapter six. Uh, colonization and the benefits of colonization. Um, mm, so this is something that's been debated since the 60s, right? Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a very difficult question to answer and one that is really uh, outside of uh, my scope. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a mix, you know, um, definitely colonization brings with it, uh, oppression and, uh, and it's an oppression that is not just, um, direct oppression, like there is exerting violence, uh, and, and bloodshed, but also an oppression in the sense of a, a hegemony that is established in our mind as to what is uh, good, uh, as ideas of what is good and bad, ideas of uh, what is right and wrong are based on impositions that have been given to us during that time, <clears throat> stuff that we're still trying to like deal with today. So there are those, that the negative side, in terms of uh, positives, there are also, there are also positives. Um, you know, whether in terms of religion or social organization or development of ideas of, of uh, society or of nation, there are also positives. So it's a little bit of both. Okay, thank you, Prof. We're down to our last two questions, Prof. The first one is coming from an anonymous attendee. Were there women warriors in revolt of Malong and Palaris? Uh, warriors. Um, you know, uh, it's quite possible. I have not seen it myself, but you know, it, it's within the realm of possibility. It's something that should be looked into. And our last question, Prof, coming from Jenilyn Supnad. Is there any account if this ranking or system was implemented in the areas of mountain province in the north? Um, most likely, remember Soliman? Uh, he's an upland chieftain from the mountains around the locals. So I would have to check the data as to where exactly along those mountains he was, but I would think that yes. Uh, yes, even in the uplands, yes. Um, he was a master of the campo of the uplands. All right. So thank you very much, Prof. Nicholas Michael C., for the knowledge that you've imparted to us this morning and for answering all those questions coming You're from welcome. our delegates. I am virtual clap po tayo for our, for our resources speaker.